You know, it's not a, it's certainly not uh, one of the high points of filmmaking, but uh, we were talking earlier about Wild Wild West, and uh, there's the collapse of Monument Valley when the spider comes in and shoots Monument Valley. Now, you could have, from a model maker's point of view, you could have made that a full movie, just the collapse of Monument Valley, uh, close-ups and multiple camera moves. And, but um, what happened was I was working on, I think, on Phantom Menace, doing the big rock formations for the Pod Race Arena, and uh, around finishing it up, and they, they came and asked the producer on the Star Wars, or on Phantom Menace, whether or not they could borrow me for a month or two, two months. And uh, it was a similar kind of a structures, you know, the monuments of Monument Valley. And the, the deal with it was that it was, it was so difficult at first is uh, I knew the physics of things that when giant rocks fall on the earth, they kind of embed themselves. They don't bounce. You know, a big rock falling off of Yosemite or something like that, just as an incredible amount of force. Just like in Men in Black, that spaceship wouldn't have plowed into the earth in that same way, but emotionally that's what you needed. You know, and we had to come up with a way that the ship would plow into the earth. It had to be low enough density rather than like real dirt to do that. Well, a similar problem with the rocks for Wild Wild, Wild West was that rocks don't bounce, and yet they were they're foam. You know, they're uh, like surfboard foam, and they're, imagine the f football size to half football size to one and two times the volume of a football. So it's these pieces that are all put together like a, like a mosaic. And um, so I thought this, the idea was that, I thought, I don't know if you would know, but there's a, a old metal mallets. I mean, uh, yeah, big mat, a mallet, you know, like Thor would do, Thor's hammer. Uh, you hit an anvil and that thing will bounce. It goes, boom, ding. And when you hear people making swords, you know, in old medieval movies, you hear the ding, 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 ding. There's a certain sound to the, what happens with a steel mallet. Well, I don't know, 25 years ago, they invented the plastic mallet that is, it's all plastic polyethylene. And inside that, the reason that it doesn't bounce, you, you hit it and it goes, whoa, it does not bounce. And the reason it doesn't bounce is inside there, inside the head of it, is a whole bunch of lead balls and in a, in a oil chamber, like, uh, like oil that you put in your engine. So what happens is when you raise the hammer, the mallet overhead like this, inertia causes all those little lead shell, shots to travel backwards. And then when you quickly hammer forward, they, they still continue that way. But then when the, all of a sudden they come to a dead stop, they travel forward and they continue the inertia uh, of that hammer down on, and there's no bounce. So the majority of the force actually, as opposed to even the, the, the steel hammer, you, you get action, reaction kind of thing, the physics of it. Whereas with the plastic mallet, it's all, the force continues on down. So I thought, hmm, that's interesting. They don't bounce. So, uh, and I knew that, I knew that, uh, you know, and I thought, God, what if we just applied that same thing to the rocks? That we make the equivalent of like a big Irwin bit or a spade bit, and we bore this hole uh, into the thing, and then we use uh, plastic jars. For the little rocks, you put a small plastic jar. For the big rocks, you put a big plastic jar. Fill it with oil, like two thirds with oil, and then fill it with the lead shot corresponding to their size. So smaller ones get a smaller amount of lead, bigger ones get a bigger amount of lead, and uh, and it, it's somewhat in the center of them. If you had it off to the side, that wouldn't be any good. You know, they might flop. So lo and behold, you drop them into uh, a bed of sand, or in this case, walnut shells, ground up walnut shells, and they go, Poof! they don't, they don't bounce, you know. So no one, no one except the people who were working on the project ever knew that. And in a way, they would have complained uh, if the rocks bounced and it looked phony and it wouldn't look good on the film, but they, you know, going, oh God, you know, it's the best we can do, I guess, you know, or maybe we'll try to solve it some other way with dust or something. But um, lo and behold, those when that Monument Valley happened, those you know, went boom, boom, and it it made it seem like it, it has real weight to it, you know. And it's it's like not giving away the magic trick, you know. You don't want them to see the, you know, the card up your sleeve or anything like that. And that's what it was. If if people had, they may not have known in, consciously that there was something wrong, but in their bones, human beings know the physics of things, you know. The weather was changing, so if we didn't get that shot at the end of uh, the collapse of Monument Valley, 
uh, it was at the, near the end of October. And in Marin County, it starts to rain at the end of October. It's like clockwork, you know. So sure enough, we got that shot first take one day, and it started sprinkling the next day and getting windier. And then, you know, we never, I don't know what would have happened had we not been able to get that shot then because we wouldn't have been able to get it till springtime, say. And they, their movie's coming out, you know. Do you know, too, that we also, for Wild Wild West, and I'm not trying to uh, whip that pony, um, the, the town, the western town, was a model, too. It was a very large-scale uh, town. I think it was, it wasn't half-scale, but it might have been third-scale. And what had happened there was that um, they went, they used a western town that was out east of Los Angeles somewhere. It was a film town. And what happened was when they, they wanted to do one of the big flaming shots right away, maybe start rather than starting out on the little ones and big explosion and all that stuff. Well, they found out that the water, nobody had tested the water pressure on the fire hydrants and everything. And they just assumed that uh, they were going to, uh, so the water pressure was good for the first, you know, uh, two minutes, minute and a half, and then whoo, dropped down. So they burned up the whole town. And uh, they lost it. It was, um, and bed insurance covered it and all that kind of stuff. But now here they were, they got one good explosive shot with the real town and they didn't have the town anymore. And so they asked ILM to, uh, to do that shot. And we uh, reproduced it. We made metal frameworks. It was all collapsible so it could go in trucks because we had to go uh, the most southern part of the United States, not Florida, but uh, right at the Mexican border in, in um, Arizona because at the time of year we were, we needed to get like a, you know, a, a 10, 11 o'clock sun because uh, the other footage had been shot when the sun was at a certain angle. And so we wanted to go as further south as we could get near the equator and have desert, a desert kind of a situation. And so all that town had to be collapsible in multiple since it was going to be burnt down. They had to have multiple walls that could go on the steel framework and everything so we could explode it extinguish it, you know, shoot it again, get rid of the old burn-up walls, put in new burnable walls, all that stuff. So that was, that was kind of, uh, that was very challenging. But um, uh, one of the things I, I loved about it, Mike Lynch uh, was, uh, I think he headed up that part of the project, and uh, he made himself a pair of shoes that had little horseshoe prints all over it. So he did the final setting, and uh, he would go out to, you know, do this and do that and do this in the final scene before he started to shoot. So it left these little, uh, as if like 10 horses had come into the, this section and gone over to here, you know. <laughs> so they'd be random horseshoes. <laughs> I, I got uh, involved with the wheelchair for uh, Wild Wild West. We had this, uh, this wheelchair where the, the um, Dr. Loveless uh, character has no legs. And so he's permanently affixed to this platform where the seat of the wheelchair would be. And among other things, we had to figure out how to make his legs go away. It was ILM's task to actually do the CGI part of that. But the wheels that they were going to put on this thing were um, like bicycle wheels with a zillion spokes. And they were kind of scratching their heads. Going, Man, this is going to cost a fortune to take out and put back all those spokes and to make it look convincing. And uh, I had been called in by Tom Pock to help out because uh, Bruce Katian was working on it and had kind of got things going, but it, it was he was having some problems with the mechanical aspects of it and wasn't it didn't look like it was going to make the deadline or be up to the quality that the movie deserved because that that was a very expensive, big budget, very beautifully designed movie, and everything had to have this 19th century technological quality to it whether it was uh, a practical set or a miniature model or CGI, whatever, it all had to match. It had to look beautiful. It had to look 19th century. Um, so I kind of gave this a little bit of thought and said, you know, the wheels probably should look like the flywheel on an old sewing machine or cash register or something, and it could just be like three or four thick, broad, curved cast iron spokes with maybe some gold pinstriping. It doesn't have to be like bicycle spokes. So they went, yeah, we can do that. So then I had to make a pattern for generating the, uh, these, these curved spokes and get them laid out just right so that they would actually be physically strong and have the look and mount into the wheel the way, you know, so the wheel would be operational. And on the first day that we tried it out with uh, Kenneth Branagh uh, playing the part of uh, Dr. Loveless, we had the chair rigged up with uh, 
knee covers that catchers, baseball catchers wear, uh, knee protectors, or shin guards, I guess they're called. And that's where he put uh, his calves to uh, tuck in below the seat. And so we sat him down in it and got him comfortable in that, which uh, everybody was kind of worried about how he's going to fit into this device, having come upon it for the first time. So he settles in, gets his legs where he wants them, puts his hands up on the armrests, grabs the joystick. We've got the little servo motor energized and connected to the joystick. And he does this wonderful thing. Apparently, Kenneth Branagh had been in a wheelchair before for some previous role, because this was a part we were worried about. Is he going to be comfortable, and is he going to be able to move this thing around smoothly and operate it? And so and we're all watching him, and he moves his eyes, camera left, and then he moves his head camera left, and then he moves the joystick and takes off like this with perfect blended smoothness. And it was like, whew, that problem's over with. And as it turned out, he had a great time in that, in that, because he has to act through the whole movie in that, in that one device. So it had to be, you know, had to be perfect from that standpoint, ergonomically. They wanted actual practical steam coming out of the little miniature boiler that's mounted behind him. And uh, I really don't think they could have got it, because I think steam at that scale, it would have been like the uh, water vapor on Ghostbusters. I think it would have just disappeared in camera. It's like when you're doing rain, you know. Um, you have to provide three or four times what you think is a realistic amount of rain for it even to register on film. And so we ended up with some kind of, uh, I think it was uh, smoke cookies or no, the little miniature, uh, miniature foggers, that's what it was. We didn't want to do it with pyro because you'd have to keep cleaning it up and relighting it and so forth. But somebody found some little foggers that are, um, you know, about the size of a hero sandwich and we just kind of gutted them out and just put the mechanism there in a little tank so that it would make some oil, some oil fog coming out of the stacks. But uh, I was very proud of that model, and it uh, proved itself uh, quite practical and workable in the, in the movie.